late 1950s, a wave of communism swept across Southeast Asia. Backed by Red China, North Vietnamese insurgents infiltrated Laos and threatened to overthrow the government. The American government worried that if Laos fell, it would open the way for communist domination of the region. At the end of the Eisenhower administration, Eisenhower felt that the problem of Laos was more important politically and internationally for the United States than the problem in Vietnam. Eisenhower called on the CIA for help. They turned to a tall, lanky Texan named Bill Lair. After 10 years as a highly successful CIA officer in neighboring Thailand, Lair was handed a difficult mission to stop the North Vietnamese insurgents into politically unstable Laos. The, the communists took the opportunity to start moving right in at that time, too. So the, the decision was made that something had to be done, and, uh, and we were ready to do it. Since it would be an act of war to put troops into neutral Laos, Lair came up with a plan to let the U.S. be hands-on while appearing to be hands-off. The idea depended on getting some help from a tribe living in the steep jungles of northeast Laos near the Vietnam border. The tribe's people called themselves Hmong, meaning people who are free. They lived on the top of the mountain, and it was a very mountainous country. So they were in a position, the ideal position, to fight guerrilla warfare because they're, they're already there. All you have to do is if they want to resist and you give them the means to resist, overnight you can have a, a pretty formidable force. Lair would be the architect of Operation Momentum, the largest secret war ever run by the CIA. Soon after arriving in Laos, Lair heard about a young general in the Laotian army. The charismatic officer, Vang Pao, held on to a small force of fellow Hmong soldiers in the rugged mountains. You know, he was great. He, and he's a great orator. You know, he could just, you'd see that he could almost lift the, the crowd off the ground with his words. After years of brutal oppression, the Hmong and the North Vietnamese were bitter enemies. Vang Pao yearned to fight the communists but knew his people were outmanned and outgunned. Bill Lair knew that this was the perfect opportunity to recruit an eager guerrilla force, so he paid a visit to Vang Pao's hideout. And I said, well, what are you going to do? And he said, well, we, either, we only have two choices. He said, we can't live with the communists. We know that from long experience. We cannot live with the communists. So we either fight them or we leave us. He said, if, if you will give us the weapons, we'll fight them. At Lair's request, the CIA authorized arms and ammunition for about a thousand men. A lot of it was worn out World War II vintage, but the Hmong were glad to get it. This old man came and we wanted to join and we told him, you know, he's too old, no, you're just too old for this. And he, he cried and said, he, he wants to be able to kill a Vietnamese before he dies. <laughs> I mean, that's the way they felt, you see. But arming the Hmong was a tricky mission in itself. Because of the rugged terrain, weapons would have to be airdropped. Vang Pao told Lair that North Vietnamese forces would certainly see the arms drops and come after them. Lair only had three days to train the untested tribespeople in jungle warfare. The first day, we, we just trained them on their personal weapon, on the weapon they were going to fire, right? Let them shoot that. And then the second day, we began to get into breaking down into we organize them into squad type units and start giving them basic tactics on that day. And then the third day, we had them set up ambushes on the trail. By the third day, communist forces moved up into the mountains to investigate the CIA airdrops. But Vang Pao's troops were ready. Using Lair's textbook guerrilla tactics, the Hmong surprised and overwhelmed the enemy. Almost overnight, they became an effective fighting force, controlling the territory like no others could. You take the lowland troops, when they start walking the mountains, they get tired quick. But these guys had never taken a step that wasn't up or down, so they could move like the wind. You'd have thought they had helicopters. So they had many, many advantages in those mountains. 
Lair's long history of living in Southeast Asia gave him a unique understanding of the Hmong. Unlike some others in the CIA, Lair lived like the locals, spoke their language, and respected their customs. If you want to do something in any country in the world, I mean, you got to work with the local people because that's all you have. And in, you may think these people are impossible, they can never do it, but that's what you've got. You've got to do it with them. Within six months of arming Vang Pao's troops, the secret guerrilla force grew to a 15,000-man army. Bill Lair's CIA bosses were surprised. Washington couldn't believe how much we were doing for so little money. The secret soldiers received arms, food, supplies, and an average pay of $3 a month. The North Vietnamese, who'd grown accustomed to free movement in northern Laos, suddenly were on the run. We could go in there with a small force and dig holes, put in these big charges, and just blow away the whole road. And they'd have to come along and redo all of that. And it, while they were doing that, you could ambush them here and there, or shoot at them, or harass them. So we could cause them an awful lot of trouble without any great risk to our own people. The Hmong army grew to more than 40,000 soldiers. But as their numbers increased, the North Vietnamese escalated their forces as well and fought them to a standstill. The CIA needed a way to tip the scale in their favor if they were going to win the secret war in Laos. As the war against communist aggression in Laos escalated, CIA officer Bill Lair and his Hmong troops used Air America, the CIA-funded secret airline, to turn the battle in their favor. Those airplanes gave us the advantage over the North Vietnamese. They didn't have airplanes. On the surface, a legitimate commercial airline, Air America had served the CIA covertly in Southeast Asia since the Korean War with a small armada of helicopters and cargo planes. Air America pumped the arms and ammunition that fueled the Hmong war effort. It moved the food that fed the Hmong. It moved in CIA people uh, who needed to come in to help the Hmong. As a result, the most visible Americans in the invisible war were the numerous Air America pilots who were contracted by the CIA to fly missions in Laos. Ted Moore was one of those pilots. The people that flew these aircraft, most of them were ex-military uh, and some of the best pilots that the military ever had. And uh, so I think they were very intelligent people uh, and uh, I think very patriotic. The Air America pilots flew hundreds of dangerous missions, landing on dirt strips at the top of high mountains, sometimes under enemy fire. And they had one other matter to worry about as well. We weren't there. That's, that was the, the line that the, the government put out to the public, and, and that's what we were told. That if, you know, if you do go down, you're shot, shot down, captured, whatever, uh, there's not much we can do for you. Bill Lair knew what a tough position the Air America pilots were in. He worried that the CIA's little covert war in Laos was about to spin out of control. When you got to a certain point and you had so many Americans up there, there was no way to deny it anymore. But if I had been calling the shots by myself, I, I would never have put that many Americans in Laos. I'm not sure the, the, the Laotians knew, but I knew that whatever happened to Laos was going to depend on how it went in Vietnam. Lair's feelings were prophetic. In early 1965, hostilities between the U.S. and Vietnam took a dramatic turn. President Lyndon Johnson approved Operation Rolling Thunder, an intense bombing campaign against North Vietnam. The Air Force then needed secret locations for its tactical air navigation equipment, called TACANs, used to guide bombers into North Vietnam. They turned to Bill Lair to recommend a spot for one of the TACANs in northern Laos. Immediately, Lair thought of a spectacular mountain named Pu Pa Ti with an existing airstrip called Landing Site 85. Site 85 was one of the tallest mountains in Laos, if not the tallest mountain, which is approximately 12 miles south of the North Vietnamese border. 
and 125 miles outside of uh, Hanoi, Haiphong area. It looked right into North Vietnam, and you were dropping the bombs on Hanoi and those places where it really hurt them. The equipment on top of Pupati provided the Air Force with invaluable navigational guidance. But despite its steep and secluded location and protection by General Vang Pao's troops, Bill Lair gave the Air Force a warning about Site 85. I said, you've got to remember one thing. Once you get something up there, if it's useful and you're really using it, I mean, eventually, the North Vietnamese will find out about it. The Air Force considered Lair's concerns, but decided to begin construction of the Takan installation in the summer of 1966. It was the closest American outpost to North Vietnam. Even though Site 85 was secret, the North Vietnamese soon realized that American bombers were getting excellent radar and navigational guidance from somewhere. Its strategic location made Pu Pa Thi a likely suspect. Where the Takan site was, it probably dropped off just straight for a thousand feet, then it went into a rock slide for another thousand or fifteen hundred feet. In order to keep a low profile, the installation was a tiny one, just a radar beacon, living quarters, some equipment shacks, and a helicopter pad, which was the primary means of transport to and from the mountaintop. The dozen or so men assigned there were undercover. The men who worked on Pupati were Air Force technicians, actually from the Strategic Air Command, who were sheep dipped. That is, they were pretending to work for, as civilian contractors. They officially resigned their Air Force uh, jobs. They, they were rehired by Lockheed aircraft, supposedly as civilian technicians. In the summer of 1967, after only a year of operation, the Air Force upgraded its capability on Site 85 with the Combat Sky Spot radar system. The new equipment was a state-of-the-art guidance system that allowed the flight controllers at Site 85 to direct the bombing missions over North Vietnam with greater accuracy. It also allowed the strike aircraft to fly above the weather and anti-aircraft attacks, which was much safer for the pilots. It was very key to uh, the bombing of North Vietnam on a regular basis, so they wouldn't be halted during bad weather. And approximately 25% of all bombing was done from this site. The new guidance system required the airlifting of 150 tons of sophisticated electronic and radar equipment to the mountaintop, a feat not likely to go unnoticed by North Vietnamese patrols. Still, knocking out the installation would not be easy. There were sheer cliffs up one side of the mountain, could only really be easily approached down the other side where the defenses were concentrated. North Vietnamese also had no road into the area, and they spent several months actually building a road approaching Phu Pati in order to bring their artillery and heavy weapons within range where they could strike the mountain. We got fogged in up there for nine days straight. And that fog, nine days later, cleared out. And we looked out east, and here was a road right to this uh, VC outpost. And they'd gone about right around 10 kilometers with that road in those nine days. Right then, we knew we were, we were gonna be in trouble then. Predictably, small skirmishes broke out as North Vietnamese forces probed the Hmong defenses around the mountain. But what happened next was utterly unprecedented. On the afternoon of January 12, 1968, Ted Moore was piloting his Huey helicopter on a routine supply mission when he spotted something he almost didn't believe two North Vietnamese biplanes were headed directly for Site 85. And as I watched them, the first aircraft, flying very low, probably 100, 200 feet off the deck, came in on the site and released uh, what I uh, assumed were bombs. My crew chief, uh, Glenn Woods, tapped me on the shoulder and said, Captain Moore, he said, uh, I've got an AK-47 with armor-piercing tracer in my suitcase. He said, would you like to go after those aircraft? And I said, certainly would. After bombing Site 85, the biplanes lumbered back toward the North Vietnamese border, and the Huey gave chase. Flying above the target, Ted Moore yelled to his crew chief that he could give him only one shot. 
Glenn opened up with an AK-47. By the time I was able to turn around, make my complete loop to see what had happened, the first aircraft was burning underneath me. The other one I did, I did not see. The Soviet-built AN-2 Colt crashed near Site 85, giving Ted Moore and Glenn Woods a remarkable distinction. This is the first time, if not the only time, that a helicopter has ever shot down a fixed wing uh, aircraft in uh, air combat. Despite the successful air engagement with the enemy, it was ominous news for the sheep dip technicians. I, I think they were sending us a message. <clears throat> we know you're there. Get out. In the early months of 1968, with a division of North Vietnamese regulars approaching, the Air Force technicians at Site 85 faced a grave situation. They were on top of a mountain with a few CIA officers, but with only 1,300 Hmong friendlies for protection, their lives were in danger. These guerrillas can't stand up and fight toe-to-toe -to -toe with the North Vietnamese Infantry Division. The North Vietnamese Infantry, I think, was as good as any infantry in the world at that time. There was a growing fear because they could see and hear the sounds of battle coming close for a couple of months. So there was growing fear to the degree that they uh, themselves took time off to dig special emplacements and hiding places along the side of the cliff. That's when we called Bill Air. I told him, you know, something's uh, going to happen. You better get these guys off the mountain. Lair contacted the Air Force and the U.S. Ambassador to emphasize that Site 85 was now the major target for the North Vietnamese. The Ambassador had the ultimate authority to order an evacuation. But after he consulted with the Air Force, it was decided to wait until the last possible moment. They figured this operation was saving the lives of two or three pilots a day. That's what they said. And if you put the technicians up there, you're risking that number of technicians against, but if you stayed another month, if you're two or three a day, you're talking about a lot of pilots. It sounded to me like then it was worth taking some risks for. As enemy forces surrounded the mountain, the frequency of skirmishes intensified. The Air Force technicians began to make plans to evacuate the site. But on the evening of March 10th, 1968, Pupati, came under heavy artillery fire. It was the first artillery attack I'd been in, and it was flat scary. And I'm sure those other guys that's out there to defend in the place, they thought, geez, what's gonna happen? Are they gonna come up the sides after us? With the bombardment as a diversion, a well-trained group of North Vietnamese did what everyone thought was impossible. Scaling a 2,000-foot cliff, they took the technicians completely by surprise. And then we heard the firing up on top there, small arms fire. And there's some bullets even zinging down around where we were. And we didn't know if that was friendlies or, or who it was, so we kind of snuck back in the bunker, you know, kind of looking around so we didn't have to get shot. The attackers overran Site 85 killing 11 of the 18 men on duty. We knew that something hit the fan, but nobody talked about any losses of any military up at the site. Uh, everybody assumed that everybody got out. Uh, the pilots that were, there was only one Air America pilot involved in it. He never said a word. And just like with my uh, shoot down in the aircraft, uh, I was told not to talk to anybody about it. In a top secret, now declassified cable to the State Department, U.S. Ambassador William Sullivan reported, it appears we may have pushed our luck one day too long in attempting to keep this facility in operation. They said, we'll do everything we can to get you out. Something like that, you know. But there's not really much they can do. As the survivors were hastily airlifted away, another controversial decision was made. The embassy panicked, and they issued the order that every American and every Thai had to be off of there by nightfall. Fearing that Site 85 was in enemy hands, the Air Force bombed it to destroy all traces of the high-tech equipment. The result of the bombing? The bodies of the 11 dead Americans would never be recovered. They were afraid the enemy was going to get this secret radar thing, so they came in and started bombing before we ever got the friendlies out. We had a lot of friendlies that got hurt in that bombing. It was the beginning of the end of the secret war. 
not only for the U.S., but for the CIA's fierce, faithful allies, the Hmong. When Site 85 fell, there was a concerted effort by the North Vietnamese and the Path at Lao to move the Hmong, chase them, kill them, whatever, out of the northeastern part of Laos and around Site 85, which they were bound and determined to control for the rest of the war. Only four months after the fall of Phu Pa Thi, Bill Lair requested a transfer out of Laos. There wasn't anything I could do that would help the situation. You know, I found other reasons to leave, but that's basically why I did leave. I just didn't want to, I never liked funerals, and I didn't want to preside at another one. He was very disillusioned at the fact that we couldn't continue to support the Hmong, whom we had mobilized and who had worked so hard for us during most of this war. Lair accepted a CIA desk job in Washington. But before leaving, he urged his old friend, Vang Pao, to move to Thailand before things got any worse. And I said, the Americans are going to leave here one of these days. You can go over there and survive. Oh, yeah, I've got to do that. But he never quite got around to it. You know what I mean? He'd say, but because he didn't really think they'd leave. In April of 1975, after the fall of Saigon, the American military machine finally left Southeast Asia. Ironically, Bill Lair returned to coordinate the evacuation of 12,000 Hmong to refugee camps in Thailand. General Vang Pao was among the refugees. The general, as he's still called by his followers, later emigrated to the United States along with thousands of his people. Today, Laotian war veterans still gather here in the U.S. to honor the memory of those who died in their struggle with the communists. Recently, Bill Lair was a special guest at one of their events. They wanted to thank him for his contributions to their fight to liberate their country. Lair mingled easily with his old friends, trading greetings in their native language. Somebody get out. I meet with Hmong today all the time, and you know, some of the old ones who were there, the first day I went up there, they've never forgotten that. They think that's the greatest day in their history. Even though they lost people and they went through hardships, in that short period of time, they probably advanced two or three hundred years. In their monumental struggle during the Laotian conflict, an estimated 30,000 Hmong died. Their sacrifice was honored by the United States in May of 1997 at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington. For the first time, the U.S. government publicly acknowledged the Hmong's participation in the war against communism in Southeast Asia. It was the final chapter of Operation Momentum and the CIA's secret war in Laos.